Good morning. I'm a Navy man, we try to start on time. Normally at five minutes before, but that usually irritates everybody, so I'm, we're gonna start straight up at 10 o'clock. So thank you everyone for coming today. The Joint Subcommittee on Disability Assistance and Memorial Affairs and Subcommittee on Technology Modernization hearing will come to order. Thank you, Chairman Rosendale, Ranking Member Pappas, Ranking Member Sherfless McCormick for holding this hearing with me today. We are here today to discuss the future of the Department of Veterans Affairs VA benefits claims processing. 10 years ago, VA underwent its first claims modernization initiative when it transformed from a paper-based system to an electronic claims environment. VA accomplished this through the development of the Veterans Benefits Management System, or VBMS. This was an important step for the VA to dig them out of the last claims backlogs crisis. Since VBMS was released, the private financial sector has continued to leverage the latest technology to provide the best experience for their customers and employees. Unfortunately, VBA has struggled to keep pace with private sector resulting in unreliable and outdated systems. Consequently, VA cannot handle the influx of claims due to the PACT Act thus far. VA estimates that the claims backlog could peak in 2024 at over 730,000 claims. This means veterans may have to wait months, if not years, for a decision. I know that the VA employees are doing their absolute best for our veterans, and they, are, and they are not satisfied with the level of our customer service. VA can always do better. I was encouraged by the, VA's five -year, the VBA's five-year modernization plan that we, that we are here to discuss today. As part of this plan, VA is piloting automation technology to help decrease the time, the process of a claim for months to days and hopefully hours. I understand that the, th that the technology may not be able to meaningfully reduce the backlog until two years from now. However, some veterans don't have two years to wait for this technology. Therefore, I'd like to learn more about the steps VA is taking over the next two years to develop this technology and whether or not VA can be more aggressive in its timeline. I'd also like to discuss how VA is prioritizing where to invest its modernization efforts. 
I hope the VA is thoroughly considering the pain points in the claims process and how technology can help reduce the time and expense to complete these tasks. I also would like to I also would like VA to provide the assurance that it is investing in state-of-the-art technology that is agile and able to modernize on a continual basis. Simply put, veterans and employees deserve the best IT available in the technology industry now and in the future. This is how VA presents, pre prevents a backlog and how veterans get decisions in hours instead of months. Thank you to all the witnesses for being here today and I look forward to your insight and feedback on this issue. With that, I yield to the ranking member for his opening statement. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses for being here today to help us understand how VA intends to modernize VBA's IT systems and improve the quality and timeliness of veterans' disability claims. Now, the PACT Act is easily the most consequential piece of veterans' legislation in the generations, um, in past generations, and it represents the most significant expansion of veterans' health care benefits in decades. When Congress passed PACT, we recognized that it would dramatically increase the number of claims that VBA would have to manage. To date, veterans have filed almost 600,000 PACT Act claims in addition to the 1.1 million non-PACT Act claims filed during the same period. The department must invest heavily in its IT and human infrastructure to ensure that these claims are processed in a timely manner and that veterans don't wait years for their benefits. Claims examiners have repeatedly complained to us that VBA's IT systems do not support the work that they do and frequently make their jobs even harder. We've heard that VBMS suffers from frequent system latency and downtimes and that system crashes sometimes make them lose their work and have to start over. And that was even before the additional crunch of hundreds of thousands of PACT Act claims. This frustration is compounded by the fact that lost productivity due to unstable IT affects the employee's performance rating. VBA needs to evaluate how its IT systems and related policies could be negatively impacting its workforce. We can't afford to lose skilled claims examiners because of poor IT systems. When PACT was being drafted, we recognized the importance of the IT system. So in Section 701 of the PACT Act, Congress mandated that VA develop a plan for the modernization of VBA's IT systems. The committee received the plan in March of this year, and while there are a lot of good ideas in it, I have questions about how they are going to fix the issues that we have raised by VBA personnel, that we hear raised by VBA personnel, issues that predate PACT Act and yet continue to this day. In fact, in 2015, the Government Accountability Office released a report on VBMS that indicated in part that VBA would benefit from a customer satisfaction survey of VBMS end users and incorporating that feedback into efforts to deploy the system. I would argue that it would also be beneficial for VBA to use a similar survey to guide any modernization efforts. Unfortunately, when I asked about such surveys during our May 16th hearing, it didn't sound like either VBA or OIT had been conducting them. Nobody knows the disconnect between VBMS and the claims workflows like the claims examiners, and it would be in everyone's best interest if VA asked for their thoughts. I hope to hear from the witnesses today how VA intends to incorporate the feedback from frontline employees in its efforts to modernize IT systems and how they intend to use technology to address the growing backlog of benefits claims. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Ranking Member. Uh, the chair now recognizes Chairman Rosendell for his opening statement. I want to thank Chairman Luttrell, Ranking Member Pappas, and Ranking Member Sheriffless McCormick for organizing this hearing with me. Uh, improving the disability compensation claims process is one of my top priorities. Millions of veterans around the country receive disability benefits from the VA. These benefits are not some sort of entitlement. They are compensation for the sacrifice of those who serve this great nation and carry with them illnesses, wounds, and scars from their service. The federal government also owes them an effective process to apply for and obtain these benefits. The Department of Veterans Affairs has a number of IT projects that frankly do not make sense even on paper. We've discussed them in, in our previous hearings. But this effort is absolutely where we should be concentrating time and resources. Veterans deserve rapid decisions through a transparent process. Unfortunately, they are struggling with 1950s era procedures and the hodgepodge of dysfunctional IT systems. The Veterans Benefits Management System is barely 10 years old, but it needs substantial upgrades to keep pace with the VA's needs. The Board of Veterans Appeals is still attempting to put an end-to-end -end system in place. The VA started introducing some basic automation a few years ago. That is without question the right approach. The only way to avoid another major claims backlog 
is to give employees advanced automation tools to eliminate menial tasks and boost productivity. However, the rudimentary automation VA has today is closer to the state of the art 1990s rather than 2023. The automation still has a long way to go to make meaningful impact. We need to close the gap very quickly in order to handle the tidal wave of claims stemming from the PACT Act and prevent another huge backlog. This committee required a five-year benefits IT modernization plan in the PACT Act. This plan is meant to spell out exactly how the department intends to spend the toxic exposure fund dollars allocated to IT. We've seen a the consequences of handing over billions of dollars with no strings attached before. I'm encouraged that the VA has submitted a, a serious detailed plan that lays out the 97 upgrades or projects over the course of the next five years and estimates the cost of each one. I have no doubt that if the plan can be accomplished, the Veterans Benefits Administration would be in much better place at the conclusion. Unfortunately, we need those modern systems and enhanced automation capabilities today because the disability compensation claims from the PACT Act are already starting to roll in. I appreciate our witnesses joining us today for this important and timely discussion about the VA needs and what they to do to get this one right and make good on the promise made to the veterans in the PACT Act. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield back. Thank you, Chairman Rosendale. The chair now rec recognizes Ranking Member Sherfless McCormick for her opening you. statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With the passage of the PACT Act, Congress fulfilled its promise to veterans to honor their service and recognize toxic exposure as a cost of war. Included in the law is much needed funding, mo funding for modernization of veteran benefits management system. This is intended to benefit, be benefit veterans and the VA employees alike. New funding is meant to streamline claims processing for benefits and improve antiquated systems that have been underfunded for decades. The Technology Modernization Subcommittee has conducted extensive oversight of VA modernization and IT contracting. A common thread has been a fundamental lack of planning, budgeting, and adherence to contracting best practices by VA and its contracting centers. VA acquisition management has been on the GAO's high risk list since 2019. GAO has cataloged issues with competition for IT contracts. While VA's annual IT obligations have increased from $4.2 billion in 2017 to $6.5 billion in 2021, the number of companies receiving those awards has decreased. We must ensure the VA does not make similar mistakes when modernizing VBMS. The cost to the government, and more importantly, the cost to our veterans are too high. VA must show a commitment to planning, budgeting, and execution of improvements that benefit veterans and the employees. As a result, I've co-sponsored co Ranking Member Takano's IT Modernization Improvement Act. This will require VA to contract for independent verification and validation for these major IT programs to include the veterans benefits management systems. As we have seen with other failed modernization initiatives, VA no longer gets the benefit of the doubt on contracting process. We need, we need this bill to provide checks and balances on the acquisition process for modernizing VBMS. Veterans and employees should not have to suffer for a lack of successful modernization again. While we work towards modernizing the IT system for veterans, I also want to highlight the impact that antiquated systems have had on the VA employees. Issues with interoperability, issues with reliability, and basic functionality have persisted for too long. We have an opportunity to provide a system that enables our employees to be more efficient and provide better service for our veterans. This means that the VA needs to listen to their employees when it comes to developing requirements for new systems. We've seen what a lack of prior work to standardize workflows across regional offices leads to. We need to hold the VA management accountable for creating a system that works for all employees and stops the silo of requirement, requirements development. With that, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> Thank you, I'll now introduce the witness panel. Our first witness from the Department of Veterans Affairs is Mr. Raymond Telez, Acting Assistant Deputy Undersecretary for Automated Benefits Delivery with the Veterans Benefits Administration. 
He is accompanied by Mr. Robert Orifice. I've been, I, yeah. Director of the Benefits and Memorial Service Portfolio for the Office of Information and Technology. We are also joined by Mr. David Bump, National Representative for the National Veterans Affairs Council and Second Vice President for the VBA at Local 2157 for the American Federation of Government Employees. Thank you all for being here today. Mr. Telez, you are now recognized for five minutes to deliver your opening statement. Good morning, Chairman Luttrell, Chairman Rosendale, Ranking Member Pappas, Ranking Member Scherfelis McCormick, and members of the subcommittee. We appreciate the opportunity to appear before you to discuss VA's plan for modernization of VBA's information technology systems. I'm joined today by Robert Orifice, Benefits and Memorial Services Portfolio in VA's on information technology. VBA and OIT have a long history of partnering to deploy technology solutions that improve claims processing to deliver benefits to those who have served our nation with honor and courage. Before 2012, the floors at the VA regional offices were buckling under the weight of paper claims folders and VA staff physically boxing and shipping claims folders from regional office to regional office. To address the situation, VA underwent a historic transformation moving from a completely paper-based system to an electronic claims processing system. The introduction of the Veterans Benefits Management System, or VBMS, along with VBA's digitization of millions of paper claims folders was key to moving VA to an electronic processing environment. Today's VBMS has changed significantly from the start of the digital journey. Every week, VBMS is updated with enhancements and optimizations to improve system resiliency, increase claims processors' productivity, and modernize system components. As a result of VA's continued investment in VBMS, VBA's digitization of inbound paper mail, and developing a paperless claims process, VA maximized telework capabilities during the COVID-19 pandemic to minimize employee impact while still maintaining service to veterans. The inability to conduct in-person medical examinations and access paper federal records led to a temporary increase in the claims backlog. VBA has reduced the backlog by approximately 100,000 in fiscal year 2022, and we continue to make progress in 2023. But lessons from the global pandemic highlighted the need for increased digitization of relevant paper records and evidence, leveraging of data, and utilizing existing medical evidence to avoid ordering a necessary exam. In December 2021, VBA established a proof of concept for automated decision support, or ADS. ADS leverages technology automated administrative tasks and workflows in the claims process by determining eligibility, gathering evidence, and auto-ordering exam when necessary for consistent, accurate, and timely decisions. Based on the measured success at this site, the automation capabilities were expanded to additional medical conditions and eight regional offices. On August 10, 2022, the passage of the PACT Act expanded VA care and benefits to millions of veterans and their survivors, resulting in a surge of claims, as well as an increase in the number of employees using VA IT systems to process these claims. While VA has and will continue to hire more people to process claims, adding more personnel is only one facet of the solution. VA must equip our new and existing employees with the right tools to enhance productivity. Today, 57 automation eligible diagnostic codes, including all 26 PACT Act presumptive conditions, have expanded to 16 regional offices. VBA is on track to expand automation to additional 103 diagnostic codes related to some of the most frequently claimed conditions such as hearing loss, mental health, and musculoskeletal conditions. Additionally, VBA and OIT partnered to create VA's five-year modernization plan for IT benefit systems to improve claims processing efficiency and create more reliable and resilient systems where systems are regularly improved with the most up-to-date technology. VA will evolve its approach to leveraging data to anticipate needs and proactively service, serve service members, veterans, and their families. IT modernization is an ongoing investment that will continue beyond the five years, allowing VA to shift its focus from veterans requesting help to VA providing a service. And this includes simplifying the process of submitting claims and proactively notifying veterans when they are entitled to additional benefits and services. The modernization of the VBA corporate database and transition of IT systems to the cloud directly supports VA's ability to respond to these challenges. Additional cloud resources have been added to VBMS, allowing the system to handle the increased PACT Act claims and additional users. Uh, many components of VBMS have been completely modernized to use modern tools and cloud services with efforts underway to modernize the remaining VBMS modules. And this will allow VA to eliminate older, inefficient legacy systems that fail to meet VA's current needs. 
VA is confident that the modernization roadmap will provide a modernized enterprise and automated decision tools to ensure VBA systems remain current, reliable, and flexible to meet the critical needs of veterans. I want to express my appreciation of your continued support of service members, veterans, their families, caregivers, and survivors, and thank you for the opportunity to be here before the committee today, and I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you, sir. The, the written statement of Mr. Tellez will be entered into the hearing record. Mr. Bump, you are now recognized for five minutes, sir. Chairman Luttrell, Chairman Rosendale, Ranking Member Pappas, Ranking Member Sherfless McCormick, and members of the subcommittee. The American Federation of Government Employees and its National Veterans Affairs Council appreciate the opportunity to testify today. My name is David Bump and I'm a national rep for the National VA Council and serve as a vice president for AFG Local 2157 in Portland, Oregon. I've had the privilege of serving veterans in VBA for 21 years. On behalf of the thousands of VBA employees AFGE represents, over 50% of whom are veterans themselves, it is a privilege to offer AFGE's views on the IT challenges facing VBA and suggestions to address those problems and serve, better serve veterans. In regards to the VBA's five-year modernization plan, AFGE supports the use of technology to better enable VBA's processors to improve their duties, I'm sorry, to perform their duties and best serve veterans. However, we are concerned about the negative effect on veterans of replacing human processors with technology. AFGE strongly supports the work done by lawmakers to protect VBA employees and to make sure that all claims have to be reviewed at some point during the process by human claims processors. It is important that our collective approach to the use of technology emphasize that information technology supplement and not supplant the VBA's workforce. The main point I want to address today is the Veterans Benefits Management System. While VBMS serves its purpose, there is certainly room for improvement from the perspective of the end user. The most serious problem that claims processors raise about VBMS is its reliability or lack thereof. The system often crashes or requires boot, rebooting, delaying claims processors from doing their required work. Claims processors justifiably fear when the system goes down that they may suffer consequences to their performance metrics through no fault of their own. Another compl complaint about VBMS is its lack of interoperability with other systems. A clear example of this is provided by the Houston Regional Office is related to letters that claims processors send to veterans to inform them of their decisions. Many do not automatically populate information requiring multiple data entry points and can often lead to errors. The process for getting a veteran's service treatment record is also a clear examples of problems with inoperability. The Portland Regional Office cited that VBMS will automatically pull up STRs from a veteran who served in a modern war from the Hames system. However, for veterans who have served further in the past, VBMS makes a request for the data from the older PI system, but does not record its own request. This leads to the employee having to make a manual entry in VBMS, but may also create duplicate requests in PIs, further wasting time. The Cleveland Regional Office cited problems with the joint legacy viewer. When using JLV to view a veteran's record, each document must be opened separately, saved, and then uploaded into VBMS. Additionally, if a processor attempts to upload too many documents at once, the system may not work and the employee must start over. Another key criticism of the system for RVSRs comes from the Pittsburgh office. RVSRs in this facility identified that VBMSR requires them to enter multiple levels of special monthly compensation on a veteran's claim. This requires multiple steps VBMS will, VBMS will not create the, the narrative for both levels of SMC unless the employee uses the system this way. This can lead to errors and create, can create over or underpayments if not done correctly. Also, if SMC is up awarded temporarily, RVSRs must manually end the SMC even though they initially entered an end date because if they do not, the veteran will never stop being paid. To improve VBMS, it would be better if claims processors could rate certain conditions at the same time and then be able to merge them based on higher evaluation rules. Fixing these problems would greatly reduce time spent on claims from workarounds, reduce erroneous decisions, and deliver a higher quality product to our nation's veterans. Another critical technology of the claims process is the national work queue. AFGE strongly supports the use of a special operations model for as many complex claims as the system will support. VBA does this currently for 
military sexual trauma and Camp Lejeune water contamination claims, among other, others, and encourages their expanded use. AFGE also encourages the VA to modify the national work use so that cases remain with the same RO for, for employee review. Every RO, despite uniform rules, has its own way of conducting specific tasks, and having employees who are more familiar with each RO's standard procedures will help process cases efficiently. Additionally, by better identifying which employee worked on a particular claim, better collaboration between employees can, achieve, can be achieved leading to time savings. Lastly, NWQ should be reprogrammed to allow VSRs and RVSRs to always have access to all readily available claims. Despite the national claims backlog, it is a common refrain from employees that they do not have enough work assigned to meet their production standards. Although National Work U was designed in part to maximize VBA's claim processing capacity, it is counterproductive to deny employees access to all available claims when the technology to do so already exists. Claims processors should be focused on taking care of veterans instead of requesting work. In conclusion, VBA must use employee feedback as it modernizes its IT systems to help veterans. AFGE and the NVAC stand ready to work with Congress and VBA to reach this goal. Thank you, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, sir. The written statement of Mr. Bump will be entered into the hearing record. We will now move to questioning. I recognize myself for five minutes. Mr. Bump, I hope you share your statement with the two gentlemen sitting to your right flank there. That's, um, I'm, I'm assuming both of you are listening. That's a very laundry, that's an extensive laundry list of issues that we need to be addressing. So is that gonna be the case, Mr. Bump? Yes. Have you guys, that's, I'm assuming that's not the first time we've heard that, correct? Those specific issues, I, I would say probably over time, uh, I look forward to, to discussing his Mr. Uh, Mr. Bump, his testimony, talk through some of those, but we do get employee feedback often, uh, yes. One of the biggest feedbacks that I got traveling around visiting the regional facilities was the, that exact list, and it seems to be reoccurring. So my, my point is, I keep hearing the same thing over and over again, I think, and that's something we most certainly need to address. Moving forward, this is for the panel. Either one of you can answer this. My, my concern is that there will, will, will not be enough oversight for the implementation of this program and will end up being like the EHR system, 20 years outdated and billions of dollars over budget. Who of you or what is, whom is responsible for the oversight of the implementation of this program? Uh, so thank you for that question, Chairman. Uh, we have uh, tiered governance that's set up to oversee this program. No, I need a name. So, Don't give me that tiered government thing because that means it's going to get lost in, this, lost in the bureaucracy. Yeah, so I am the lead of the 701B uh, execution IPT that is responsible for running this plan and making sure that we have updates there. And then we have the executive lead, George Waddington, who is my executive lead over this IPT overseeing the 701B modernization plan. Okay, so once we start implementing this, this um, you're who I'm coming to if I need any questions answered. I am who you're coming to for any questions that you need. Do you, can you give me an idea moving forward with the amount of backlog that we have and then the time frame of implementation of this program in parallel, I'm assuming, as, the, as our employees are working hard and diligently to make sure that this backlog is taken away. You, can you give me an assessment because two years it's quite a long time. And as my colleague to my right stated, they're the ones that are suffering. Can you give me an estimation on when that backlog and how that backlog will be reduced once this program is online? Thank you, Chairman. I think we are expecting the backlog to grow a little bit through 24 and then drop dramatically in 25. A lot of that is dependent on the incremental releases as we adopt more technology, as we implement some of the features that are in the 701B plan. We do have some coming up that I think will be very impactful to employees. A part of it is the ADS, the automated data support uh, uh, that, that I'm driving for claims automation, uh, which does a lot of the automation for uh, tasks associated with the claims process. Our intent there is to use uh, evidence of record, so uh, ordering exams, service validation, 
uh, and then being able to present to the employees uh, the information they need to make the decision on those issues faster. We're also looking at technology that takes the veteran's file and allows those claims processors to be able to search the file much faster. We call that smart search. We're expected to deploy that in summer. That will add some tremendous value, reduce that claims development time as employees are looking for the necessary records to determine whether they need to order an exam or make a claim ready for decision for raters. We've also got new technology we are testing now called automated data ingestion. Um, that is where we are taking veterans who have an exam, they see a provider, they get a disability benefits questionnaire filled out and completed and returned back to us. The UBMS ingests the data, the computable data from that DBQ, and we uh, put it into VBMSR and we present it back to the employees, the rater, for them to validate and help them make that decision, that recommended decision for that. So that's some of the ways we're doing that. It, it, two years, I think, is the time frame that we're looking at because of the way that we release the technology for automated uh, decision support. Um, we are factoring two years because of the sort of conservative approach that we are doing for automation. Uh, change is hard. Our employees have been through the last 10 years, some huge transfer so we're being very thoughtful as we... To that, to that point, because my time's running short, sir, um, the one thing that I continually hear is training, training, training. Once this program, this platform is implemented, are we training up for the initiation or are we initiating and then training? Because when we, ended, when we implemented the PACT Act, we put the cart before the horse and we're suffering because of it right now. So I would say we're happening in parallel. So as new features are coming on board, we prepare the staff and we train them uh, when it's deployed so they have the tools and the certain information necessary to do the work. Okay, thank you. I now recognize the ranking member Pappas for one question. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Tellez, if I could start with you. Uh, committee staff recently visited both the Columbia, South Carolina and Chicago regional offices and heard uniformly from frontline employees that IT systems don't support their work. Uh, we heard about that directly today from Mr. Bump, um, and that substantiates longstanding complaints from across the country. Um, at our hearing on PACT Act implementation last month, I asked Under Secretary Jacobs about this issue and about um, how we can capture uh, user satisfaction information through surveys of VBMS users. Secretary Jacobs wasn't aware of any and promised to get back to me. So can you comment on uh, the evidence that such surveys are happening? And is there a reason that VA wouldn't want to hear from end users about uh, their experiences? Thank you, Congressman. Uh, I'm not aware of any specific direct users, but we do uh, often engage with frontline employees as we do new releases. So we engage with them prior to release, we engage with them after the release to measure how effective was that particular release. One of the things that we are looking at since the hearing is a change management contract where we can adopt on the VBA side, a, a survey, if you will, for a lot of things that we are deploying uh, to measure the success of the, of the efficiency of those tools that we are deploying. So short of sitting next to a frontline worker at a congressional hearing, how, how can you capture feedback in a way that's gonna inform uh, changes in an efficient manner? Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so with automated decision support, we have uh, um, 16 regional offices right now. So we have dedicated weekly calls with the employees there to get their direct feedback on those specific automation tools. We have a tracker that employees are allowed to use or encouraged to use. So as they are working claims and there's something they, that they want to report as a ticket or issue, they support it. So we have weekly calls with them and we have weekly engagements. So I would say regular touch points with the field frontline staff. Uh, we have optimization champions that we check in to see the areas that we can identify opportunities for optimizations uh, in, inside. Well, I appreciate that um, information, but I think um, something more systemic uh, that's also forward-leaning and proactive um, would provide the department the information it needs to really understand the full picture there. Uh, Mr. Bump, if I could turn to you, uh, thanks for um, you know, chronicling uh, some of the pain points that you experience in your work. We are really grateful for the work that you do to support our veterans. Um, and I'm wondering if you can comment on what avenues end users have of these systems to raise their concerns uh, related to IT issues. Thank you, Congressman. Um, the, the, the ways that we have to interact that Mr. Telez described, um, they're all after the fact. What would help, and I think help the process and of course then help employees serve veterans better, would be if we were in before these things were designed. 
and before they were implemented as opposed to afterwards. Um, because a lot of the time when, when, when new systems are deployed, what, we, what, what VBA employees end up doing is beta testing software. And that's been the case, I've been with VA for 21 plus years. And that was the case on day one, it is the case now. We need to be involved on the front end as opposed to the back end. And do you think there are ways that VBA and the unions specifically can work together? Oh, certainly. Um, uh, the, I think now that we finally have a confirmed undersecretary, who I, I would like to thank him personally for attending our latest labor management forum meeting, he listened and asked thoughtful questions on how not only unions, but the employees who we represent can better interact with, with VBA's management staff that puts these things together. Okay. Now, Mr. Tellis, one thing that Mr. Bump mentioned that we've heard from uh, employees uh, on is this issue of needing to reboot systems. Uh, they freeze up. Uh, there's significant downtime and instability in VBMS. Do you know what the cause of those issues might be? I mean, it could be a case-by-case -case issue, but is there something more systemic that we should be concerned about? I think it's probably more on a case-by-case -case basis. We, we have had some issues, but I'm not sure that I would say that there is a consistent trend for that to happen. But I could certainly take that back and go uh, through that. And Rob? And if I could add, we do track that. So we do know by a case-by-case -case incident uh, what causes that. Every time there's an outage or something like that, we do a root cause analysis. And so we do to go in and we investigate what caused that incident and we link it back to either specific thing, it could be network, it could be something with the system itself, a, a defect or a change that happened and did not work as expected. So we do maintain that list for every outage and every incident and we do an investigation to find out what happened and to prevent it from happening in the future. Okay, I yield back my time. Thank you, Ranking Member. Jim Rosedale, you recognize, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Orofsi, Mr. Tellez just referenced the uh, automated data ingestion system, which is an extension of the Google Chrome browser that pre-populates information for the claims raters into VBMS. Uh, this costs less than $2 million and 400 employees are using it. Do you agree with Mr. Tellez that ADI is a success and that it should be continued? So thank you for that question, Chairman. Uh, I think ADI has been a success in getting functionality to the users quickly. It's been a way of getting features into the hands to help them process claims faster and more efficiently. Uh, at the same time, it has given us great input into how we could provide those features into VBMS, which as you know, takes more time and costs more money. So this was a great way of being able to test this functionality and see whether it will work and to be able to bring that into the VBMS in the future as we move forward. So if it's a success, are you planning on continuing its use or are you planning on pulling the plug on that system? Uh, we plan on continuing the use until that features are built into VBMS. It is a browser extension and so it is not meant to be as robust and long lasting as something that's built into the actual software. And what kind of time frame do you think it's gonna take for this to be uh, phased out, shall we say? Uh, we have the first parts of this starting to phase into VBMS this summer. And so we're looking at rolling out through probably second fiscal year of second quarter of the FY24. Okay, so what I'm making sure that we don't run into is the exact same problem that we are experiencing with Oracle, Cerner, EHR, Vista, where we have a system, Vista, that is working, it's functioning, it's, it's, it's helping the, the facilities across the nation, and yet we've spent billions of dollars for the Oracle Cerner system that is not functioning, okay? I, even in the five facilities that it's currently at, and yet we've got billions of dollars going out the door to try and, and create that new system when we have one that can be, is being utilized right now to deliver those services uh, to those facilities, to the veterans. And, and so I, what I, I don't wanna see is this dual track um, investment or drain of resources when we have a system that is already working. We had IT people before us about a week and a half ago and said that the problem with VA is that they continue to try and consolidate these IT systems and make them larger and larger and larger and, and they have proven that 
if they keep them smaller with the vendors, that they've been, they've been much more effective, okay? So we're gonna be tracking that to make sure that we don't continue to dump money into vendors to continue to make them big while we have a system that is, that is currently functioning. Um, Mr. Orvisi, I, I also wanna get into, uh, as I look at this report on page 28 out of 106, where we look at the, um, the, the chart that shows how a claim is, is handled. Uh, one of the things that, that most of the people, I think, sitting at this dais and in this audience would recognize is these automated decision support systems, okay? When you call in and get a recording and you're supposed to start hitting numbers to find out where you're gonna be directed to and, and, and that automated system is trying to resolve your problem, most of us get really frustrated, okay, dealing with that system. So what I'm trying to figure out from you, or even Mr. Bump, you might, might have a, an idea about this. What are the triggers or keywords that, that are being utilized to make sure that this thing gets rapidly transferred to a real person to deal with our veterans? And what kind of time does that take to get them over to a real person? Yeah, so thank you for that question. I do not have an answer on for that hand for that, and so I have will have to take that back for the record. Mr. Bump, do you have any insight to that? Um, the time it takes to get to a real person, mm -hmm. that I don't. Um, but the the oftentimes the problem that we have in the call centers is the time limitations that the employees have to actually speak to a veteran or their spouse once they actually get to a person. The VA limit, the, the performance standards are set so that time is limited to, I believe it's roughly about eight minutes. How long they are how long allowed they, to speak to how long one the, of the veterans calling in. Right. Okay, so, so this is gonna go to my, to my other line of questioning. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, uh, give my time back, I'm out, but I've got my, a whole nother round of questionings. Thank you, Mr. Rosendale. The chair now recognizes Mrs. Sherfless McCormick for her line of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Bump, one of the most striking statements made in your testimony is that it's common refrain from VSRs and RVSRs that they do not have enough work assigned to them to meet their production standards and that they have no constant, and that they have to constantly request new work from their coaches. Considering the size of the black backlog, this is quite concerning. Do you know if there are any technological or functional impediments to the national work queue that cause this problem? And do you have any suggestions on what we would, how we can solve and help employees serve veterans more effectively and efficiently? Thank you, Congresswoman, for that question. Um, the national work queue, the way it works is it assigns work to a particular regional office based on an algorithm that calculates how many employees work in that office. What always seems to happen though, is it doesn't assign enough work to the office to keep folks busy throughout the day. And once it gets that work to those offices, the, the individual supervisors assign work to the individual employees work queue, but they only, they keep, they hold some of it back intentionally so that when folks run out of work, they can then go to their supervisor and get more work. The further exacerbate, exacerbating that problem is when there's no more work left in the station's work queue. So what you, while, while VA tells its employees, don't wait until you're out of work, let me know, as a supervisor, let me know when you've got one or two claims left in your work queue. Then that gives your, supposedly gives your supervisor time to find more work for you to do. If we could open up the national work queue so that employees have full access to, what, to all the claims that are out there, you wouldn't have to have all those steps where an employee gets assigned not enough work to meet their performance standard on a given day. Then they have to go back to their coach. Their coach has to find work. And meanwhile, that could result in the employee sitting idle for, you know, who knows how long. 
Mr. Bump, would you mind giving the committee some perspective on the age of the IT system that make up VBMS? Well, um, as, as I believe it was Chairman Luttrell said, VBMS is at least 10 years old. Um, the advances in computer processing and uh, how the private sector does things, um, we are behind. Um, we, one anecdote that, that I always think of when I'm asked that question or when I think about that question is when I started with the VA nearly 22 years ago, in September it'll be 22 years, um, I was told that BDN was gonna be going away. Well, here we are 22 years later, BDN is still there. And it informs, I'm not sure of the actual interactions it has, but it's still there for a reason and it still interacts with VBMS. So not only do you have VBMS that's 10 years old, you have other legacy systems that are even older. Um, it, it, VBMS itself, you know, for a system as old as it is, it, we're able to work in it, but we could be doing better. And how does the age affect your work product and productivity? Well, every time VBMS gets, gets upgraded, um, there are workarounds that result. And those workarounds, not only do you have to remember what all of them are, but they add to the time that it takes to process a claim. Because you have to, in some cases, manipulate VBMS, as I mentioned with the, the example with the RVSRs, you have to manipulate the system to get it to provide the right result, as opposed to it just providing the right result. And do you feel that employees actually have a seat at the table as the VA plans to modernize? Not enough of one. As I mentioned earlier, um, we need a seat at the table as these things are being developed, not after they're developed, and then we just end up testing them and telling VBA what doesn't work. And my last question, in your time at the VA, do you feel like the acquisition and the procurement process, um, I'll yield back and access later. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Franklin, you recognize, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you uh, to our panel for being here today. I, uh, Mr. Bump, I, I, my line of questioning really is going to follow up on what you were just touching on about uh, how antiquated uh, VBMS is now and really how do we get to where we need to be. So I appreciate you chronicling uh, in your testimony the challenges that we're facing. I read all of these, and, and, and candidly, what dismays me is just seeing the level of problems we're having now and where I think we need to be and the fact that, you know, and just in, in looking at the vernacular that the VA is using, we're talking automation, decision support systems. These are things that the private sector figured out a generation ago, and now it's, that's aspirational, it seems like, for us to try to get there. Um, from our folks from the VA, I, I would love to hear, we've, we've got a, a freight train coming down the track. We're behind now, woefully behind, I think, in where our technology ought to be, and it's gonna get worse. Uh, we're not doing right by our VA employees. Even worse, we're not doing right by our customers. And personally, from having been in the military, but also the private sector side, I think your customer should be the one defining what's acceptable. To me, I don't think 125 days should be defined as a backlog. To me, that's an absolute failure. And if we give people a pat on the back for meeting, you know, because I got it in 124 days, shame on us. But how do we get to a point where when we have big data, cloud computing, predictive modeling, data analytics, are we ever going to get there with VBMS? Uh, how do we fix these programs to where we're out there proactively, uh, you know, helping our veterans? It ought to be, to me, there ought to be, a, we ought to have systems that would say a veteran comes off of active duty, goes into the VA system. We know based on where they've been, what they've done, what they've been exposed to, these are the types of things that they're probably going to face down the line. How do we get out there ahead of that and help them? Or are we going to be talking about automation 20 years from now when the rest of the world's passed us by. I just, I would love to yield the three minutes I have to, to the two of you to tell me how we're gonna do that better. Yes, so thank you for that question, Congressman. So there are a lot of components that we are working on today that will start to enable those features. We have come from a background when VBMS first started that this was one giant application. And so to touch any component, you were reworking all of VBMS to make sure that was working. The plan outlines how we are continuing the journey of breaking VBMS into smaller pieces 
So as we talk to, we can send that work off to other places or we can modernize smaller pieces and work with a more diverse group of providers in order to make sure those capabilities are modern and up to date. As part of that work, we are also decommissioning a lot of our legacy systems that we have out there. Uh, we have components of VetsNet that we are modernizing into new modules within either part of VBMS or standalone modules by themselves that interact across the other work type modernization that we are doing, which is making it simpler for employees as they don't have to switch between tools, but also enabling future work in which we can connect those big data to make sure all the systems can use that data that is available and that we could integrate with other service providers like VBA is doing on the automated decision support so we could bring those new capabilities to bear. Right now, it is very difficult to do that with uh, some of the environment that's still outstanding from our legacy updates. And so within two years, the plan is really getting off, uh, off those legacy components to enable that work. We're not really happy with ha how fast we're going, but we appreciate the support that we've gotten around PACT Act. And this is enabling us to accelerate a plan from 10 years down to five and we're always looking for opportunities to accelerate that further and to see what we could provide faster. And sir, I would just like to add for on the VBA side for we are using a professional services contract provider to help us with the claims automation. So they are bringing to bear techno the latest technology automation tools to help us as we are uh, accelerating the claims processing time to get to uh, a radar so they can make a decision faster for veterans. Mr. Bump, what's your take on what you hear? Thank you, Congressman. Um, VA has, has always been kind of slow with adapting to change. And the, the common refrain, and this goes back to, at the very least, um, General Hickey when she was the VBA undersecretary. It's a big, big ship and it takes a long time to turn it around. Um, I, th I hope that we get it right, um, but I also hope that we keep in mind the people who are doing this work and that we train them on these new systems and that we involve them in the design of the new systems. That's what I don't see enough of right now is the involvement in as we're designing these things because the, the, the people who use these systems are the ones who are probably best informed as to what they should contain and how they should work. Thank you, and I'm over my time, but hope is not a plan of action, and that's why we look to the gentleman to your right for that. But thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Franklin. Mr. McGarvey, sir, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Orifice and Mr. Bump, at a hearing last month on the implementation of the PACT Act, I raise concerns that were voiced by the local out of my, my region, AFGE Local 611, which represents the VBA regional office in my hometown of Louisville, Kentucky. Um, as you all know, what we talked about, that rating veteran service representatives, or RVSRs, don't get production credit when they defer a case as not ready to rate. There are multiple problems that go along with this um, because it, including the concern that an RVSR may not get the case back once more information is available on the claim. So you know, to do right by our vets, we've got to make sure that the people handling their claims are given all they need. I had a town hall last Friday in Louisville. I had several former Marines show up. Uh, they might argue that there's no such thing as a former Marine, but I had several Marines show up who are dealing with the issues of having been at Camp Lejeune. One, one guy was stationed there for three and a half years. Uh, incidentally, Louisville is where the Camp Lejeune claims are being handled. And we've done a really good job resolving those claims. Is a resolution, though, that some of the claims are being denied when maybe they shouldn't, and maybe they're being denied because they don't have the tools right now to further investigate claims and they come back as a denial. So, you know, we're trying to make sure, especially with the Camp Lejeune claims, that honestly, the government that exposed them to these, hand, these hazardous material, materials is more speedy and more efficient in helping them out. Um, so Mr. Orifice, a question for you, given this background of what we know is going on since the PAC Act, is the lack of RVSR production credit for deferred claims 
and the inability to get the case back once more work has been performed on the claim a technological limitation of the national work queue, or is it a management decision to handle claims this way? Yes, thank you for that question, Congressman. Right now, NWQ is able to route the work according to the rules, so that is not a technology issue. Okay. What can we do then to help resolve these claims for the tens of thousands of Marines at Camp Lejeune? Sir, we will continue to process those in a priority manner as much as we can, but otherwise I will have to take that question back for you and get your response to that. Okay. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Um, Mr. Baum, what other changes should the VBA implement to the national work queue to make it easier for claims processors to perform their duties and get the credit they have earned? Thank you, Congressman. Um, in addition to what you mentioned about returning deferrals to um, the raider who who, were, who originally looked at the claim, um, one suggestion, again, would be to open up the national work queue more so employees don't have to spend valuable time looking for work instead of serving veterans. Um, if we would have a system where, you know, all of the work was available all of the time, instead of assigning work to a regional office and then manually assigning that work to, to individual processors, I think that would go a long way to speeding up the process. What is keeping that from happening right now? Much like the deferral issue, um, I don't believe, these gentlemen can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe it's a technology issue. It's a management decision to utilize the national work queue in the way it's being utilized right now. Sir, I think what we have is a national distribution of work based on a lot of different factors per regional office, and then locally they have the right to distribute the work as they sit fit for the thing. I think one of the opportunities we have, sir, is this NWQ modernization that we have in the 701B. It does, you know, NWQ was designed at a different time. Here we are today. We have an opportunity to look at how can that work be distributed much more in an agile fashion than maybe we do today. Uh, but NWQ modernization is one of the efforts we have identified as a 701B, a critical element to design a to deploy uh, as part of 701B. Thank you, and in my remaining seconds, all I'll say is this committee works well together to protect our veterans. Uh, as we see right now, however we can help you to speed this up, because these men and women, uh, in some cases, their, their literal lives depend on it. So thank you all very much. Thanks, sir. Mr. Self, you recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as has been mentioned before, the PAC Act was obviously passed with uh, no thought about the infrastructure needed to be in place uh, to service it. Uh, so uh, down the line, did you raise this issue prior to the passage of the PAC Act? Mr. Tellez first. The infrastructure system, I think we probably raised uh, some concerns with overall. Uh, I think one of the ways we were addressing that is using our professional managed services to, to automatically uh, do some of those simple tasks so that we can oh, get I that just, information. I just asked, did you raise the issue, Mr. I'll have to go, I'll have to get your response to that, sir. I'm not sure. Okay. I know uh, I, we had some feedback that we provided around this uh, infrastructure's ability to support, mm -hmm. uh, but we also did start pre preemptively increasing some of the infrastructure in, in anticipation of the PACT Act being done. So I think up to 18 months before passage, we did start on increasing some of the capacity of training environments, of ability to VBMS okay. scale. Mr. Baum, how about the council? I'm sorry? How about the council? Um, infrastructure to do our jobs is always a concern. Um, my biggest concern with the PACT Act is training. Um, and if you think of you know, employees as human infrastructure, um, we did not do a good job okay. with the training aspect. Thank you. Mr. Tellez, you said that you were confident of the system in your testimony. When are you going to be confident of the system? Sir, I would say I'm confident in the system now. I think the process that we have for deploying automated decision support tools, 
uh, has high quality. Uh, we do have uh, user uh, frontline employees involved in that process. We use uh, the human set. Mr. Mr. Tellez, what are the metrics that you use to say the system is getting better? I mean, I, I think all of us would question, what are the metrics that you use? Because we've gone from 65,000 pre-pandemic to what today? Over 400,000 by y'all's testimony. And it's going to peak at uh, over a million when we get to the Terra and non-Terra. So what are the metrics you use to tell us that the system is getting better? Is it numbers of days, the 125 days that we can take down to what? What are the metrics that you're going to use? I think the metrics that we use are the metrics that we report to this committee on the average days to complete, the average days pending, have those. In the and for automated decision support, we are still in preliminary stages. We hope as we deploy those nationwide, you really see the true benefits of how automation can uh, reduce the decision making for veterans and we can get those decisions and benefits earlier to veterans. Last question, when will we get back down to 65,000 backlog? Sir, as we are projecting to have that backlog increase about two, our projection now is about 400,000 between 24, uh, we start seeing that backlog drop down in 2025 below 100,000. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thanks, sir, Mr. Crane. Thank you all for coming today. Um, Mr. Tellis, I'm gonna start with you. Uh, right now, the VA is about uh, four months behind in our wait time in processing claims or 125 days. Um, by April 2024, it's projected that the VA's backlog will peak at about 730,000 PACT Act claims. Knowing this, uh, what do you think the wait time is gonna be come April 2024 when we have uh, the peak of the PACT Act claims? So we're projecting our backlog to be about 400,000 with 2024, 20, uh, between now and 2024. I, I don't have the data with me on what we're projecting for the, what we think the wait time, so I'll have to get that back for you, sir. Okay, but you would say a substantial increase in wait time, just based on the numbers now and then the increase then? I think with the increase of the backlog to about 400,000, I think there will be some increased time. As we are deploying more and more automated decision support tools, adopting more technology, I hope to prevent that happening from more. Uh, that's on us. Okay. Mr. Tellez, uh, you seemed a little upset when Mr. Bump spoke about the need for instructive feedback on the front end of the system design, not beta testing on the back end. I kept seeing you reach for your little talking button there. Can you, can you go ahead and address that? Sure. Uh, Yes, really what I would like to highlight for here, so the, the employees are not uh, absent in the process. So when we come up with new ideas and things, we bring in subject matter experts and we bring employees from the field. So we hold requirement sessions with employees uh, along the way, sometimes several times. We invite employees for what we call user acceptance testing. Hey, we heard your requirements, here's how it is in a system, does it work? So we get that direct feedback and then before we deploy new functionality, we have users also test the system to make sure it works. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bump, what do you have to say to that? Anything? Any feedback? Thank you, Congressman. Um, there's simply not enough of it. Okay. That's what I would say. Uh, where we, we select a small number of employees and have them test things out. Um, those employees are, are not often of the same experience level or of an appropriate experience level. So there's just not enough of it. Do you think if that was done within the parameters of what you're suggesting, we'd be having less problems now? I think we would because I think we'd have less workarounds after the fact. You know, Mr. Bump, I, I found it pretty interesting when you made the, uh, the comment, if we were to open up the national work queue, it would uh, drive pro productivity and dis uh, decrease the backlog. Uh, Mr. Tellez, what do you think about that suggestion? I think it's a great suggestion. And as I mentioned, we're looking to modernize NWQ and I think we have a lot of opportunities to look at how work is distributed in much more agile fashion. I don't have the, the, the answer for you today, sir, but I can commit me that is part of the 701 boot plan. So we are committed as an effort to modernize the NWQ and, and figure out how we could, what opportunities there are to make that process better. That doesn't seem like something that you would need to modernize. That seems more like a command decision. 
that doesn't seem like something that is technology or needs to be modernized, right? That just seems like something that the individual at the top actually needs to say, hey, we want to decrease the backlog we have here. Mr. Bump made a pretty good suggestion. Why don't we try that and see if it actually decreases the backlog? Sorry, we'll take that back for you and get your response. Okay. Who's making that call, Mr. Tellis? Who makes that call? Our field of operations leadership. Who's the name? Give me the name. I believe it would be uh, Willie Clark. Who? Willie Clark. Willie Clark. Deputy Undersecretary. All right, uh, Mr. Tellis, last question for you. Um, what, is the, what do you think the biggest difference is between how the VA operates and how the private health care system operates? I'm sorry, sorry, I don't have, I, I don't, I'll have to get your response to that. I don't, I don't work in the healthcare, so I'm not sure I'm, I'm able to answer that question. No problem. Mr. Bump, you want to take a shot at that one? The differences, private sector, VA? Um, my experience with the private sector healthcare system, um, when, when I go see, uh, when I go for a test or see a doctor or something like that, the very same day I can see and interact with not only my records, I should say, I can interact with my records, but also my physician can see those same records. That's not always the case in VA. Yeah, one of the big problems is, and this is some of the, a problem that many of us at, on this committee have with the VA and its desire to basically have everything under its own roof and really try and halt you know, veterans from going out in town and getting care is, one of the biggest differences in the private sector, if you have a backlog or you're not performing well, you go out of business. In the VA, that's not the case. We just keep appropriating more money to you guys. And there's really never any accountability. And that's, the, that's one of the things that I want you, know, you guys to understand is that's why so many of us want to see veterans be able to go out into the private sector and get care out in the private sector, not, not, not dismissing the VA completely, because we know that there is a time and a place for VA health care. But this, this is part of the problem. In the private sector, you don't have these type of problems, because if you consistently have these type of problems and are behind, like Mr. Bump has testified to today, you go out of business. Thank you. I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Crane. Mr. Deluzio, you want me to move over? Take your time. I, I can... Chairman, I'm, I'm ready. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Okay. You're recognized. All right. Thank you. Uh, and good morning, everybody. Um, I want to start, um, Mr. Bump, with, with you, sir. As you know, you know, I'm proud to represent many VBA employees who work at the Pittsburgh uh, VBA regional office, represented by FGE Local 1627, their president, Michelle Fisher. Uh, reading your testimony, I was pleased to see some of the concerns coming out of the workers in that office uh, raised. Um, but frustrated to learn that claims processors, uh, as you describe it, and as they've talked about, have to employ a bunch of workarounds uh, to get veterans correct monthly compensation, um, not to mention how error prone that usage of the VBA management system is. So, Mr. Bump, my question is, could you explain for my colleagues and me how an innocent error could negatively impact a claims processor's performance, what that impact might be for them? Thank you, Congressman. Um, I'm, I'm good friends with Michelle. We know each other well, have known each other for nearly a decade. Um, there are no, if you, if you, if there's an error on a claim, um, it, it affects your performance standard no matter what kind of an error it is. Um, it could be something as simple as, um, a portion of the veteran's service record not being correct in the system. Um, and it, it, all of these workarounds that we have to do to get the, the correct result for a veteran, they're all, they're all points in which an error can be made. So the more times that you have to manipulate the system to do what it's, to provide the result that it is supposed to provide, that's more opportunities for an error in either data entry or the system not capturing the data correctly. Um, but, you know, 
the employees who work for this agency, they, they, they do their best. Um, again, more than half of the folks who work in VBA on the front line are veterans themselves. So they are committed to getting things right for veterans and getting veterans the benefits that they deserve and that, at the, that they've earned. Um, I believe it was Chairman Luttrell who, or no, it was Chairman Rosendale, who mentioned that these are not entitlements. These are benefits that are earned. Um, and it, it's, we need to make the system work better so we don't have to do things in the manner that Michelle described when she was asked about this. Well, and I should say the obvious piece, in addition to affecting performance, slows down decisions for veterans. Uh, as you're, you know, as folks who are processing these claims have to spend more time to get it right to avoid errors that, again, will also negatively impact veterans who are waiting for decisions here. Definitely, um, the more, the more that we have, the more steps we have to take. That's the longer. That's lengthens the time that it takes to process a claim. Well, about a minute and a half, and, and so I, I realize it's a big question, but what do you think VBA needs to do to modernize here to make this work better for veterans, for the folks who are working, both? Well, there are things that, that system enhancements could do. Um, automation, I think, will help at some point. I don't believe we're anywhere close to where we need to be with that. Um, but there are management decisions as well, and one of them is opening up the national work queue, um, assuring that, that raiders get a case back after they have to defer it. Um, and additionally, if we could change something so that a, a claim stays in the same office once it's started, because right now, you know, we have a system where I could work on a claim in Portland, do what I need to do, send it back up, and then a claim goes to Pittsburgh or, or Denver or St. Petersburg. And every time that an, an employee touches a claim, they have to go through it from the beginning. Because if there's an error and they don't catch it, that's their error. So in order for employees to meet their performance metrics and feel good about the job they're doing and, and you know, keeping their career, they have to go, they have to almost rework a claim from the beginning every time they touch it to prevent getting an error. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You'll back. Thanks, sir. Mr. Sismani, you recognize, sir? Thank you, Chairman Luttrell and uh, Cha Chairman Rosendale for holding this important hearing. Um, and uh, thank you to the witnesses for coming in. The United States has uh, seen uh, how far technology has come and advanced technology will continue to make our constituents' lives easier and our country better. However, the Department of Veteran Affairs, along with many other government entities, are struggling to keep up with the modern times and the technology that provide uh, in the private sector to com that companies can utilize there. Uh, back home in Tucson, I met with a local uh, American Federation of Government Employees Union in March and learned about the complexity in the claims process and the innovation being done in the private sector to help veterans uh, within this claim process. I know that the dedicated men and women at the VA are working to help our veterans, but outdated technology and quite frankly, bureaucracy serve as roadblocks for those who put their lives in the line for this country. But unfortunately, it seems that some businesses have built a business model based on bureaucratic incompetence. And that was my takeaway from, from this meeting. So as, as we're looking at the investment in veteran affairs, you may know this, I'm also in the Appropriations Committee, so my questions are, are very interested in the investment in, in VA here, making sure that our veterans have the right tools and that there's the right accountability on those resources as well. So Mr. Tiaz, best based on the Veterans Benefit Administration five-year modernization plan, the Department of the VA is requesting $125 million to modernize the VA.gov platform. How, how will these changes to VA.gov improve the veteran-facing aspects of the website and specifically the benefit claims? On the same vein here, uh, requesting also $36.5 million for improving its national call center. So I'm very interested in seeing uh, not only anecdotally how this will improve, but how will you keep track of this and what's the accountability that these funds will actually produce the results that you're intended for them to produce? 
Thank you, sir, for the question. Uh, the enhancements of the VA.gov portal are really important to, to veterans because it allows them to interact with us better. It allows them to do more work with VA, exchange information with VA, submit more claims through the VA.gov portal, and more importantly, allows us to deliver more information to them as well, such as decision letter download, which we had delivered last January. So we'll continue to expand on that, expand on the ability for the veteran to choose their mode of communication, whether it be a text, email, or whatnot. So from our perspective, it has a better uh, experience for the veteran, uh, and automation is a factor in that too. And I think when you think about automation from the veteran perspective and the employee perspective, it really just creates a better experience altogether when we can ha have those pieces. And so we measure that by the usage of the tool uh, and, and, and then the success of the implementation of that measuring along the way. Uh, I, I can't speak to the NCC directly, but I'll have to get your response to that for, for that. Thank you. I would like a, a response to that. When, when we look at, as I mentioned, at these investments that we want to make sure that our veterans are taken care of, we've pledged to uh, pull the line on, on the resources here to Veteran Affairs. We want to continue to make sure that these funds are being used for its intended purpose, but also that they produce the results that we need them to. So can you, uh, and I've got another question that will probably change topics and take a little longer with the amount of time we have left. I just want to uh, dig in a little deeper on, on this conversation. Uh, if you can just go a little, uh, uh, I, again, a little deeper on the how the results would be measured and how, what, what would claim success uh, with these resources? What, what would you say that that's exactly the intended purpose and that we can claim success? And, and how long do you think that would take us to get there? Thank you, sir. I think one way I would measure success is more claims submitted through VA.gov than paper. Right now, even though we are seeing an increase in veterans submitting claims through VA.gov, we still get a fair number of paper. And I have to convert paper, as I have to scan it, I have to digitize it, and that's not always a perfect thing. Um, and so I would say one way we'd measure success there is more veterans are using VA.gov. I would also measure the success of the interactions with the number of veterans that use the site for those tools and resources, such as the number of decision letters that are downloaded and accessed each month. So we have a number of those metrics to measure the success of that, to making sure that veterans find trust in the system and that they're finding it useful and they'll keep coming back to engage with VA that way as well. Well, th those are good, uh, Mr. T.S., and I agree with them. Uh, you know, one here that I, thing that I keep hearing is the wait time on these claims, obviously. The, the paperless uh, claims hopefully speed up that time and the wait time for our veterans keeps on reducing, that will be a measurement that I would be very interested in you uh, pursuing and tracking so that we can make sure at the end of the day we can make all these changes from uh, paper to electronic, but if the, the process is not sped up and our veterans are waiting the same amount of time for whatever other reason, then I wouldn't call that success. So in my mind, success uh, would mainly revolve around the wait time that the, our veterans are waiting for these claims. I yield back. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, sir. That concludes our first round. We're going to move directly into the second round. I recognize myself for five minutes. Mr. Telez, you said, is it Undersecretary Clark is the, the manager of the PQS, or I'm sorry, the NWQ? Do you work directly, do you answer to him? My, my concern is if we're, if we're onboarding this new platform that's supposed to assist claims and decrease a backlog, but it seems to me that the National Work Queue is the one of the major problems in this chain of command, if you will. And then we have, we have stations that are in, out, that don't have work because the National Work Queue doesn't deliver claims to, am I understanding that correctly? From my colleague over here, that was a pretty, that, she stated that earlier. I think that's what I heard, but I have to get back to you on, on a, a response to, to that. It seems to me that we need to address the national work queue because I think the backlog from what you said next year at 100,000 will be substantially higher. Now, if we're onboarding this new platform in parallel, I think we're still, it's still going to be problematic because packages aren't being disseminated properly and then everyone's being penalized if they're not conducting proper oversight on each packet. Does, does, that, does that hold water to you? I, I am not aware that there was challenges with distribution of work to the regional offices, so I'll have to come back to you with a response on where there may be opportunities. I, I am not aware of any, sir. Okay, please do. Um, sir, I recognize. I recognize the ranking member. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to follow up on um, one issue that I had raised in the first round. Mr. Bump, if I can direct this to you. I was asking about system disruptions, which you highlighted in your testimony, and wondering if um, you can just talk about how these issues might affect VBA personnel um, and ar around the issue of uh, not being granted or potentially being granted relief for lost time uh, due to these system disruptions. Well, thank you, Congressman. Um, when, when VBA employees are not processing claims, um, they're, they're not able to earn the appropriate number of work credits or transactions that they need to meet their performance standard. Um, VBA in the 20, nearly 22 years that I've worked there, um, the same position has been held about what is called excluded time. Um, it is granted by your supervisor. Um, but that said, VA has, um, I'll call it limited, um, sort of subversively limited, and I don't mean that in a bad sense, the, subver the use of the word subversive. What they do from the national level is if you, as if, if a particular station has too much, what they perceive to be too much or over a limit of excluded time that they grant, they have to answer for it. And the, 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 what that leads to is that leads to a very conservative approach when it comes to granting or not granting excluded time. Um, excluded time is meant to account for the time when VBA employees can't do their job because of system issues, um, or in some cases, extraordinarily complex claims. Um, but if we're not granted the appropriate amount of excluded time to cover the time that we've lost due to system issues, the only negative effect to the employee is there, it's harder to meet your performance standard. So there are times when that's the case, when you're not granted the relief uh, because of an issue that's out of your hands with respect to the system. Definitely, definitely that happens. Um, some offices are better than others, um, but it's, it's, you know, it's something that each individual office controls, so it's dependent on the, on the leadership in that office as to what their philosophy on granting that time is. So it's inconsistent. Thank you. Mr. Tellis, do you think that's fair that employees could be adversely impacted in terms of uh, reviews and credits based on uh, a system issue that's out of their hands? Well, as you know, we're in a completely digital operating environment. So when we have a system issue that, that happens occasionally, some time to time, there is an impact to our productivity. And we have ways around addressing that. So we offer training. There are other ways we can fill our time for employee stuff. Uh, to your specific question of uh, how it's happened at local regional offices versus national, I will have to get you back a response on that. I am not aware that there has been a disparity in how that's approved or disapproved. Different. Okay. Well, we'd like more information on that. Of course. Uh, I yield back my time. Thank you, sir. Mr. Rosendale, you recognize? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I'd like to make a reference to a movie I saw recently. It's called Ford versus Ferrari. And in the course of the movie, in this one scene, Carol Shelby is sitting out in the lobby of Ford Corporation waiting to visit with Henry Ford II. And he watches a file come in, and it goes through five sets of hands and then goes into the office and, and someone hands it to Henry Ford II before he actually takes a look at it. And it had been looked at by 20 other people before it even arrived on what they called, the, I think, the ninth floor. It seems to me that this is the problem that we're having with this processing, everything that Mr. Bump is describing and that uh, the other two gentlemen are describing. This, this information is going through a lot of hands. And the way that I think it is evidenced is, as I, again, look at the the Benefits Delivery Information Technology Systems report that you all provided, if we look at page 13, it talks about the development of the plan taking 90 days, intake one day, rating five days, authorization and award five days, development 90 days. And if that file is being handed off to 
different people before it's even completed, as Mr. Bump referenced, or there's someone sitting there that can't get that information in a timely manner, this is the crux of this entire problem that we're, that we're dealing with. So Mr. Tellez, Mr. Orifice, your plan says automation is the key to speeding up processing and successful automation relies on access to all veterans' relevant data, better quality data that computers can read directly, improved infrastructure, and supportive policies. None of these conditions are in place today. So please tell me, how are you going to implement these fixes and how will your process and the results be different as we go forward? Thank you for your question, Congressman. So one of the things I would highlight here is our automated decision tool. So as a result of the pandemic and our inability to access- I'm tired of hearing about the pandemic. I'll be honest with you. I've got veterans that can't get their, their benefits right now because they're being required to use mask mandates, okay? And our veterans facilities, so we don't even want to go down that trail. So one of the pillars of the, the one of the principles of the 701B is leveraging data. So one of the things we're doing at claims intake when veterans file a claim is we're automating those steps that you just highlighted there. So uh, claim comes in uh, for a packed act claims right now. Because intake, it doesn't seem to be a problem. We're looking at the development correct. of the claim. Correct, correct. So one of the things we're looking at is uh, being able to obtain uh, the medical evidence from our interagency, so from VHA, from DOD, from community care, and we pull those records in, and if we are able to rate that decision based on the evidence of claim, we'll hand it to a rating, uh, an RV. So how are we going to improve that? Okay, I understand you. Yeah. How are we going to improve this going forward to, to take this 90 days and, and narrow it down and somehow make sure that, that that claim is kept in one person's hands instead of being distributed in, in different locations? Yeah, so thank you for that question, Chairman. So we have a lot of pieces that all come together to help address this. And so we had questions about the VA.gov portion at the very beginning. And so it starts with how we receive the claim from veteran and making sure that we have all the relevant data and then the connections to the various systems to make sure that we are pulling the service treatment record completely, whether that's a modern record or a legacy, more legacy record from an older theater of duty and that we have all that data coming together. We, the plan outlines how we are putting those into interactive services that other providers like ADS can use to have. So what tools ready. are that lacking right now, okay, that we are not able to gather that information and get it into a claims processor or an underwriter's hand so that we can deliver the benefits to the veterans? What is lacking? What, what systems are failing? And what, what do we need to do going forward? Right, so the first thing that we are really addressing is our corporate database, which has all of our data around the benefits, uh, claims, rating, historical data around it, and that is a monolithic database that is not structured properly to enable the support that we have. So one of our first key activities is updating this massive database of veteran data in order to make it more accessible and to have new technologies that could interoperate off of that new and modernized data platform. Mr. Chair, I'm down to 19 seconds, so I'm going to yield back. I've got deep water to go into yet. Yes, sir. Thank you. Ms. Sheriff McCormick, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Bump, I want to pick up where we left off. In your time at the VA, do you feel that the acquisition of procurement IT systems have been done in a thoughtful man manner? Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, I, I truly believe that the VA has the best intent as to how it modernizes its systems. Um, what, what I think might be lacking um, outside of what I've already testified to is to more employee involvement earlier in the process. Um, what I see as a problem is, in connection with all of that, is that some of the, the people who are putting these things together um, from you know, what platforms we use to how they're designed. Those aren't folks who have done the work. Those aren't frontline employees who have, you know, been utilized, been trying to get benefits to veterans as quickly as possible um, as their job. Um, there are obviously limits to how much that can be done, um, but I, I think we can do many things better with our 
not only our IT systems, but as, Ms. as Congressman Rosendale was mentioning, how we reduce the development time. Um, one of the things that was going through my head as, as Mr. Telez and, and, and Mr. Orifisi were answering those questions, if we could get to a, a point where we didn't have to request that information, where as soon as a veteran files a claim, or more to the point, as soon as they're discharged, that data was already there. Right now, we have to go and make requests to whether it's Hames or Pies or, or uh, DFAS for personnel records. If we didn't have to request those things, if it was automatically provided, that would reduce the development time and it would reduce the backlog because we wouldn't be waiting for those records. Now, some of those records you can get in less than a day, but many of them you can't. So I, I think the, to, to answer the question about thoughtfulness, if we would think about those things instead of technical requirements, I think we'd be a lot further into the process. Thank you, Mr. Bone. My next question is for Mr. Chalez. VA has a long history of failed modernization attempts, everything from health records to supply chain to financial management. At the core of this issue is the lack of comprehensive thought and planning at the beginning of the acquisition program. Last Congress, our committee passed the IT Reform Act to begin to address the challenges with IT programs. And this Congress, I've co-sponsored a bill to require independent verification and validation of large program, including VBMS. What process are you currently using to plan for and award contracts to address the new automation initiatives? Thank you, Congresswoman. For automated decision support, we do have an independent verification validation vendor that validates the automation logic as it's in production. So we do use that uh, as validation, uh, and I think I'll pass it to Mr. Orfsey, who can speak to you on the IT side of the House. Yes, and Ranking Member, thank you for that question. We are also interested in IVMV. This past March, we awarded an IVMV contract, which covers all the products within the BAM portfolio. And so we are working on making sure that we have IV coverage for all of our major projects, including VBMS. And how do you intend to measure success? Specifically, what kind of variables are you using to measure success? Uh, so for, for the IVMV? Mm -hmm. yeah, so for the IVMV, it is product by product basis, but it looks at the requirements as they're delivered and the outcomes that are supposed to be delivered for that product and the IVMV contractor goes through their test suite to ensure that those requirements are being met and that those outcomes are also delivered by the system. Now, do you have any specific measures that you're looking at? I would have to go back and bring those back for the record. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Crane, you recognize, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Bump was talking a second ago, and he was talking about why claims are going from uh, Portland to Pittsburgh and getting uh, kind of farmed out. Why is that happening, Mr. Tellis? Why isn't one uh, processor being able to handle a claim all the way through? Thank you, Congressman. It is my understanding that the claim typically stays with the regional office. So there might be opportunities where, for reasons, that the capacity is, is at a different regional office, but otherwise I, I have to get you response. Mr. Bump, do you have any idea why that's happening? When the national work he was originally designed and implemented, it was what, what the messaging around it was, was to have the next available person ready to take the next action. What wasn't thought about was how that works with employee performance standards and you know, what it actually takes to do things that way. Because there are differences in the way regional offices operate and frankly train their employees, um, you simply can't trust what was done before. So if we could change how we manage the national work queue to allow a claim to 
perhaps not stay, it, it doesn't, wouldn't necessarily have to stay with the same employee, but if it could stay within the same office, instead of having to, you would, you would have more confidence in the work that was done before you because you'd be working with people who were trained the same way you were by the same people and you understand what they have, to, what, what the employee who went before you did and why they did it the way they did it. Does that uh, make sense, Mr. Tellis? Again, I think it's really about capacity. I think the intent is to try to keep the claims at the local regional office for processing. But again, I think there are times when capacity says that we might have a more capacity at a different regional office to do it. I think the training is pretty standardized across VBA, so I don't know that there would be significant nuances from regional office to regional office processing claims the same way. So I would expect, again, the intent is to keep it with the regional office uh, unless there could be an opportunity to, to, to make a decision on that veteran at a different regional office faster. Mr. Bump, you were shaking your head as if you don't agree with the training being uh, centralized. The, when, a, when an employee onboards at, at VBA, um, the VA made a conscious decision a few years ago to shorten the amount of time that the training is done centrally. So it used to be where Folks went off to what was called challenge training. And you were there for, challenge training itself was 10 weeks. You had four weeks of sort of learning the lingo, I'll say. And then you had six weeks where you, you traveled and you were all trained together by national level trainers. Now, what we've transitioned to is four weeks total of national training, and then you're sent back to your regional office where you are trained by regional office personnel. So to say that it's standardized, perhaps the material and the manuals and things like that are standard, but the way you are taught to do things varies from office to office. Thank you. Last question, Mr. Bump. Has anybody, you said you've been working with the VA for close to 20 years, is that correct? 22 years this September. 22 sorry. years. Has anybody explained to you um, why they don't open up the work queue so that the VA staff is more efficient and uh, not sitting around as much? Um, no, the answer to that question has never really been explained. Um, Have you asked the question? We, we, it has come up. Um, I serve on... Um, both the, the VBA Midterm Bargaining Committee as well as our National Labor Management Forum. And these are topics that are discussed there, so certainly. And the, the answer is always some form of, we want the system to work the way we designed it to work. Instead of taking into account changes that, that affect how that works and the, the, the projected increase in the backlog. Um, if we're gonna expect this increase and we're gonna do things the same way we've been doing them for the last 10 years, I don't think we're gonna get a different result. Thank you, I yield back. Thanks, sir. Mr. Siskamani, you're recognized, sir. Thank you, Chair. Just a quick question uh, to piggyback off uh, the last part of our conversation on the investments and how that's gonna be improving. Um, in regards to these changes, yeah, I have a question about how this is going to benefit uh, older veterans as well. My district has over 70,000 veterans, which is one of the highest concentration of veterans in the country in any congressional district. Um, out of the over 70,000 veterans, many of them serve in the Vietnam War uh, with service records and medical records that date back decades. I'm uh, pleased to see the VA using optical character recognition software to help find key words in the claims paperwork, but I've also learned that the accuracy still needs a lot of improvement on that. And we've, we've seen live examples of, of that happening. So Mr. T.S., how are you planning on improving the optical character recognition so the automation can accurately scan all these old service and treatment records that my Vietnam veterans um, have now? 
Thank you, Congressman, for your question. Uh, because we are using professional services, they are bringing the latest automation technology tools to bear. Uh, part of it is a learning process, natural learning processing, so it takes time to learn and do that, so we see that accuracy improving, improving. It does get harder when you start getting into those older uh, medical records with our handwriting, uh, so that, that is an industry challenge wide for handwriting. So again, we're using the, the lender, or our, our vendor, to uh, implement that automation and to learn uh, and improve the accuracy of that. And then I'll turn it to Mr. Orfsi here. And if I may add, we are also implementing the smart search capability within VBMS. And this is a service offering from Amazon as part of the cloud services. And it has OCRing, it maps it to where in the document occurs. It also does recognition across images. So if it's not just type text or um, computer generated text, you know, also has a high rate of recognizing handwriting. And so this is one of the improvements that we're rolling out this summer. So a veteran can, uh, claim processor can search across the e-folder, and it has that ability to search both images and handwriting for increased accuracy. Is, is this part of the same outsourced uh, uh, service that Mr. Tez was talking about, or is this internal? This is internal to VBMS, and there, this will be fully uh, exposed to other providers to utilize this data, so it's not just going to be isolated to VBMS for its use, it'll be available broadly to any service within the VA that wants to use it. So regarding the service that we're, that we're hiring from the outside, Mr. TS, and, and the, you know, the, we're, I guess, uh, contracting the highest technology available, as, as you're describing, and, and the learning process on that. Um, again, I, I'm all about the efficiency on this, and in order to have efficiency, we got to have expectations and timelines. So in, in your mind, uh, again, um, you know, no system will ever be perfect, I understand that, but if there is improvement to make, how, how much improvement have we made? And uh, if, are we instructing the, the, the service and uh, company that is giving us these services what we need from this and, and, and the challenges we're having with the older records as well? So we do have a measurement for that, but I will have to get you back of the, the, where we are improving on that, sir. Yeah, please do. And I, so I wanna see how, how much we've improved and what do we still have to go in terms of the metrics and the goals that you would set out uh, on that and, and what kind of progress we're making towards that? Yes, sir. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thanks, sir. Mr. Rosendale. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Bump, I really like your comments about keeping a file in one location. And let's just say for a moment, let's just say that everyone was trained exactly the same. Do you still think it would be easier to talk to the person that's sitting next to you that has that file if it was transferred over than trying to reach across the country than to talk to someone? Definitely. Um, it's, it's, it's not only easier to talk to your, your fellow coworkers in your office just because you're more familiar with them, but it's also, I mean, frankly, if you're all in the same, if you're in the, sa in the office on the same day, you can actually just go and physically speak with them and have everything at your at the ready to do that. Um, and doesn't the, the, the actual act of transferring that file to another location take a certain amount of time? Um, tr the work that the National Work Queue does to, to draw things back up into the cloud and then disperse it, that takes a certain amount of time I'm not sure how often that is, but the, the, all of the information, so all of the, quote, paperwork that goes with the claim, that's readily available to everybody at the same time. But that said, you're not supposed to access a veteran's records unless you have a need to do so. Exactly. So, so Mr. Tellez, is there any part of that that you disagree with that it's not, do, do you not feel that it's a lot easier to talk to someone sitting next to you with the documents right there in front of you than trying to go across the country to, to bring them up to speed on all the work that you've just completed? I think meaningful engagements with employees is always a positive outreach, for sure, but I think we've built an environment where we can have the flexibility to move the claims around where we have capacity. And so I think that's one of the benefits of the NWQ is to allow us to do it. And as I said, I think the intent is to keep the claim at the local regional office to work it, but there may be times when we can just Mr. tell us the intent of legislation many times that I have seen go through doesn't get implemented in that fashion once it gets translated by the bureaucrats that are, that are working on it. I've got a question. Uh, 
Mr. Tellez, Mr. Orifice, is there, there is a misconception that the VA's ability to access medical evidence and existing health records has anything to do with the replacing of the EHR. In reality, you're already using information from VISTA, from the Department of Defense, and from private physicians to, to a limited extent. What is necessary to improve and expand that? Uh, so thank you for that question. Uh, we actually do have efforts underway to expand that right now. Uh, we have work that's going on with HDR on the health side, which is pulling information directly into the claims to eliminate steps that claims processors have to do to pull health data from Capri into VBMS. And there is continued work with our partners in DOD to bring all over older service treatment records into our systems and have it right there in one tool without having to have the request that Mr. Bump has been referencing that are manual steps that need to be taken right now. And there's always more work to do as we work with our partners in VHA to pull that data from either VHA or other community care aspects to have that data readily available to VBMS and the claims processors. To Mr. Tellez and Mr. Orifice, you mentioned that you're attempting to expand the automation at 103 uh, diagnostic codes, representing 103 medical conditions. When will you be able to speed up and automate most claims for these conditions, not just a, a token number of the sample claims? Thank you, Congressman, for your question. So our intent is to automate or make uh, eligible those diagnostic codes about 90% of what we call all rated claims issues. So that's about 250 diagnostic codes. That's where the real bang for our buck is. And we're expecting about an 18 to 24 month period to accomplish that, get that information, get that capability in the hands of users. Beyond that, it's probably gonna have to take a little bit of look at to see whether or not those are automation eligible. We can automate the, that process. Or uh, do we have enough claims to invest the dollars to automate? So I think there's a little bit of opportunity for us to look at those uh, diagnostic codes beyond the 250 to determine whether not it's feasible to do that. And, and Mr. Bump, how do you feel that your, your folks that you work with are going to be able to, to uh, integrate these systems he's talking about? Thank you, Congressman. Um, we're, we're really in the infancy of all of this. Um, it's, it's, I, I hope that at some point we, we get to the point where we're where we have more of this information already there, the automated piece of it um, is, is, as I mentioned in my opening statement, I, I hope that we're never at the point where we're relying solely on technology to process a claim, that at least at some point or points that an actual human has to touch it um, because there's things automation can't do, so. I, I agree. I agree. Thank you so much. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you, sir. That concludes our second round of questioning. I recognize the ranking member Pappas for his closing remarks. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to our panel for your comments today and for the work that you do for our veterans. Um, and uh, given the implementation of PACT Act and the impact that it's going to have on VBA claims, it's really crucial that IT systems support the work of the claims processors to ensure that veterans are going to receive their benefits in a timely manner. Modernizing these systems must be a partnership between VBA, OIT, and end users. These folks have a wealth of knowledge, and that was borne out by this hearing today, about what's working and what's not working. So with hundreds of thousands of claims awaiting adjudication and more coming in every day, I don't think we can ignore the voices of those who do this work each and every day, and I hope that that can be front and center uh, as we move toward greater modernization and find greater efficiency for our veterans. So thank you all for your contributions and your comments today, and I yield back my time. Thank you, Ranking Member Pappas, and thank you all again for coming before us today. I look forward to continuing to work with the department and all our partners tracks, as, well as we track the VBA's implementation of its five-year modernization plan. I believe the tools the VA is developing are critical for reducing the backlog, improving employee morale, and restoring veterans' trust in VA. Do know this, gentlemen, we are very unified on this committee, and our primary concern is our veterans. I think you saw that today. We are watching, and with that, I ask unanimous consent that all members have five le legislative days to revise and extend the remarks and in include extraneous material without objection. So ordered, this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>